Okay, next we have next we have Yao Dong, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo and the creator of GEF, an open source commercial censorship censorship circumvention tool uh, that is intended to defeat sophisticated systems such as the Great Firewall of China. He is also uh, the author of Familio, uh, a project that aims to build a layer zero minimal blockchain to support richly layered application development. And he will be presenting Melmint, a trustless, trustless stable cryptocurrency. Hi, so the subject in my talk today would be about Melmint, which is a way of creating a trustless yet stable cryptocurrency. Now, so the thing about cryptocurrencies is that it has these really cool properties like censor censorship resistance, like decentralized finality, and independence from institutions. But there's a really big problem, which is that um, the price of cryptocurrencies is really, really volatile. And that is really bad because if we have vol volatility orders of magnitude above fiat currencies, then we have we can no longer use these cryptocurrencies effectively as money because they can't be a long-term store of value, they are inconvenient as a medium of exchange, and it is very hard to use them as a unit of account. And this is the obvious problem. The less obvious problem is that if we have really volatile cryptocurrency prices and which are affected by things like how successful the cryptocurrency is, then this makes mechanism design hard because when we design mechanisms, we often measure our rewards and punishments and everything payoff matrix in terms of, let's say, Bitcoins. And if the value of the Bitcoin is both volatile and highly dependent on how this whole game theoretical thing plays out, then it's very hard to rigorously reason about these things. And the main problem uh, causing this extreme volatility is very inelastic supply. And this is because cryptocurrencies are typically issued on fixed schedules, so one X amount of Bitcoin per hour, um, and it does not respond to the market at all. So let's look at some existing attempts to fix volatility. The most classic way is using stable coins, uh, which, which peg the coin to an external asset, such as the US dollar. There's also trustless way of ways of increasing the supply elasticity. This includes my previous work, which is Elastic Coin. So for stable coins, well, stable coins are, very, are a really old idea. Um, they just peg your cryptocurrency to something else, like gold or the US dollar. Now, this is really hard to do right, because it generally sacrifices stability or decentralization. So the most usual way of doing this is to simply have a trusted issuer back each coin with each one dollar. This obviously introduces counterparty risk, and it centralizes the whole thing. And we still, there are, there are newer systems that try to do this with an algorithmic central bank. So we uh, try to sort of adjust the supply of the currency with a smart contract so that the value of each coin targets $1. Now this has a problem I call trying to peg coins to silver with gold reserves. So you're trying to peg a currency to an asset you cannot own or own any derivatives of. And I think this is fundamentally impossible. Even if you solve it, there's, there's the whole oracle problem. Like you have to have a mechanism to actually tell the system what is the value of a dollar, what is the value of your currency. And this is really hard to decentralize. And usually we just use a trusted oracle. So my previous work is Elasticoin. Uh, my approach is let's just forget about pegging. Let's just really increase the el elasticity of supply of a cryptocurrency. And the way I, Elasticoin did it was by fixing the cost of minting a coin to a, this fictitious u unit I call a DOSC, which is a day of sequential computation. So what a DOSC is, is the cost of renting a CPU today and occupying one core of it continuously for 24 hours. So it's the cost of 24 hours of sequential computation right now is the value of a DOSC right now. And this can be measured with non-interactive proofs of sequential work, and it trustlessly keeps up with Moore's law because we are measuring it with respect to the fastest processor we have seen. Now this means that the supply of the new coins becomes extremely elastic because now we're fixing the cost and not the amount of um, 
that of coins that are minted. So this is establishes this sort of price ceiling. And it, it also eliminates a lot of the volatility in demand itself, because you know that, let's say, in 100 years, Bitcoin's not going to be worth a million dollars. You know exactly it's not going to be worth a, above a certain amount. And there's a price ceiling because every time the price increases above the cost of minting it, it, every, it becomes profitable to mint an unlimited amount of coins and increase the money supply. Now, this is obviously not enough because this is only a one-way peg. Um, it cannot handle drops in demand. So this prevents bubbles from forming, but it cannot handle crashes. So if the coin crashes to, let's say, one-tenth the cost of minting it, then this cost doesn't really matter. No one's going to mint more coins. It's going to be like any other fixed supply volatile coin um, very far away from the value of one dosk. So it can get stuck in this sort of high volatility regime if demand drops permanently. Um, so we need something better. We need a two-way stabilization scheme that is still as decentralized. And there we have Melmint. So to give Melmint a bit of context, it's within the context of Thamelia, which is this blockchain I've been de developing. Uh, the details are not important. Um, the, most important part is that it actually has two built-in crypt cryptocurrencies, the MEL and the MET. So the MEL is the daily use currency that's money-like, and the MET is a fixed supply currency that's only used for proof of stake. So there's sort of like the equity in this is the consensus. So MEL mint, of course, is the way of minting MELs. So MEL mint uh, has three, three parts. First of all, we have a DOSC minting procedure. This mints us a new cryptocurrency called the DOSC that tracks the value of a DOSC, so a day of sequential computation, the unit I introduced earlier. Then a main loop actually pegs one MEL to this one DOSC. And finally, we have a crisis recovery system that recovers from crises that make the peg impossible to hold. So at first, how do we establish this trustless unit of value? Um, so we simply use Elastic Coin. Um, we want the cost of creating one DOSC is simply 24 hours of sequential computation measured in a sort of trustless benchmarking way. Now, this is just like Elastic Coin, except we add one thing. Every single block, uh, the value of each coin denominated in DOSC decays by 0.1%. This means that most of the value of your DOSC balance goes away after a day. And this makes DOSCs completely useless as money. Um, however, what it does mean is that one, the value of one DOSC closely tracks the cost you, to mint it. So if for some reason you want this useless coin, then you're going to pay pretty much one, one day of sequential computation's worth of money because you can only create them on demand, essentially. They have to be fresh. Um, so this is a useless currency. However, we can use this token as a tool to build our main mechanism. So in our main mechanism, we auction METs, so the fixed supply equity tokens, not stable, uh, for DOSCs. So every 20 blocks, we create enough METs to increase the supply of this equity by 1.2% a year. And we sell these METs for DOSCs that are destroyed, and we use the auction results of this auction to derive a price estimate for the MET, so for the equity token, uh, how much DOSCs is one MET worth. And the, in the auction, it's a two-phase auction. First of all, we submit bids. Uh, people submit bids to bid for the Delta I, newly created METs. However, one interesting thing is that in the second phase of the auction, we allow random people to come in and dis and fill in these orders, essentially. They can buy out their bid, and only the remaining um, bids actually contribute to the price feed. And this is because Delta I is a rather small number, and if we don't have this buyout procedure, it's very easy to attack the system by simply overbidding for um, METs, and you wouldn't need to waste a lot of money to do so. And now we have a price for the MET. Uh, we can then guarantee that anyone can come in with a certain amount of MELs and exchange them for a certain amount of DOSC of METs. So essentially, we can guarantee that every time someone comes in with one MEL, we exchange it for one DOSC worth of METs, or rather, K, Kappa DOSCs worth of METs. Kappa is a devaluator that is usually one. 
So essentially, this backs the, each mail with one dosk worth of mets that is created on demand and vice versa. So the key observation here is that we are pegging, um, pegging the mail to a certain amount of mets, and this peg is defended through inflation. So if the mail is too expensive, we, inf we inflate more mouths to bring it down. If the mail is not expensive enough, we inflate mets to buy back the mouths. Now, so the implicit reserves that back the mail, the circulating supply of money, is actually the share capital of all the people who have bought into the mets, um, because the mets receive transaction fees and things like that in Familio. So holding mets, would, you are contributing your money and you're risking expropriation to defend this pack. And of course, the risk of doing, you know, you being expropriated through inflation is going to be baked into the price. So we have here this sort of implicit reserve ratio, which is the Mets market cap over the male market pack, and we want this to be over one. And finally, in extreme cases, this might drop below one. So imagine there is a general cryptocurrency panic, and everyone throws away their Mets because you know it's volatile and stuff, and then there is a sort of flight to safety into males. Now this will cause the ratio to become lopsided. And people will start like throwing away their males. And to defend the peg, the Mets would hyperinflate, but that would not be enough. And the whole system will crash and burn because your proof of stake token is now worthless. So this is obviously bad, and therefore we have an emergency devaluation mechanism that is basically if we detect a hyperinflation in the backing equity, we devalue kappa to 0.75 its previous value. So, so essentially what we're saying here is that, okay, we're not trying to do a really rigid peg. If we really can't defend it, we let it drop, and we save the system by sacrificing the peg. And then whenever we are in this recovery phase, the peg actually can crawl up, up and down a bit. So hopefully, if you know, market conditions stabilize, we can re recover the peg. If not, it'll just sort of stabilize at a lower peg. And all of these things that can be actually ported to other blockchains. It's not limited to Familio. And one potential, diff one potential pitfall is that you do have to have an independent valuation for the Met. You can't just have the map be used to back mouse. And that'll be like senior odd shares, which is very hard to stabilize. The key about uh, Melmint is that the Mets are actually independently valuable equity capital in the transaction volume, in the transaction fees of the system. So one thing you might want to do is to levy an extra transaction fee and give it to Met holders. So finally, let's look at the evaluation. First of all, this implicit reserve ratio is really important. Um, we want the value of all mets to be greater than the value of all mouths. And this sort of sounds like something you can't really predict, but actually we can. This is because if we have an annual GDP, GDP here using a really loose way, basically velocity. Um, but So you have a certain amount of uh, economic activity, and we assume that we capture 2% of it uh, as revenue. And this is... This is approximately the range for Bitcoin miners and you know, taxes and things like that. Um, then under a 3% discount rate, then the total protocol revenue capture will, will simply be two thirds GDP. So let's look at the ratio of M1 to GDP for both the US economy and the Bitcoin uh, economy. And for the Bitcoin, we use the money supply of Bitcoin divided over the, an estimated on-chain transaction volume. So we see that in the very worst case, well, this ratio is well below one. So we don't really have an issue where you know, we don't have enough things to expropriate to defend the peg. Um, we also do a Monte Carlo market simulation. So <coughs> this, we make this sort of stochastic model that has a met supply and mail supply, and we vary the demand for both of these assets randomly. And this sort of allows us to see the performance of Melmint under varying conditions. And we also have a panic mechanism where when the reserve ratio is below one, then um, we simulate a panic. Basically, it, all it does is sell. It doesn't buy anyone else. So in, a nor in the normal case where there are not a lot of panics, uh, we see some rather obvious results, which is that um, the P here is the... Um, 
reserve ratio. So we see that if the reserve ratio is less than one, then most of the time it spends unpegged. So uh, definitely this reserve ratio thing is important. But as long as the reserve ratio is above one initially, it rarely gets below one long enough for the peg to break for a long time. And we see that, for example, here, most of the dips are from the P equals 0.5 and 1. Here, the proportion of time spent on pegged goes down dramatically. And finally, we see that as P goes up, generally speaking, the, everything is just more stable. We also um, stress test the crisis recovery by simulating a scenario where demand for the net, so the backing equity assets, go down dramatically. So every day, there is a higher chance that it'll go down than go up. And this will trigger panic after panic because the reserve ratio is constantly deficient. And what we test here are different devaluation factors. So every time there's a panic, how much do we devalue the peg? So if we, we run this like 500 times, and we see that the devaluation is actually really important. So if we defend the peg at all costs, we're just going to take the whole system down for us. So if you see here that if the, if the devaluation factor is one, then, there, then the Mets, the equity, the proof of stake would inflate like a thousand times. And that'll probably, in, rea in real life, that'll probably just cause the collapse of the whole system. Um, and we see that, however, that as we decrease the devaluation factor to you know, 0.75, which is a value I chose, the maximum inflation becomes a lot more reasonable. So this is like an extreme crisis. This is where people are just dumping your coin and never coming back. Uh, we still can, can defend a price, you know, around half our desired value and have the equity inflate, like, I don't know, a few times. It's not good, but it's definitely not a catastrophic scenario. And this, again, ties into the fact that since we can't hold any backing assets, we have to accept that in crises, something bad is going to happen, and we can only mitigate the effects by not trying too hard to defend the peg. So for example, this is one instance of my simulation. So if the factor is 0.99, we see that the solid line, which is the MEL price, the does, it stays rather close to the peg. However, the price of the backing equity drops precipitously. And uh, in real life and not in our simulation, this will probably lead to everything going to zero because no one wants to hold this anymore. But in a scenario where the factor is 0.75, yes, the peg depegs further, but um, the prices re remain reasonable for both of these assets. So the takeaway here is that with you know, any sort of low volatility slash decentralized stable coin, you do not want to defend the peg at all costs because you probably can't. Now finally, we compare it with other systems. So Melmint is quite unique in that it does have a strong peg to a specific value target, but it has no trusted parties. And it has a very, it, it, its peg is quite robust because it's generally over collateralized in its implicit reserves. Um, now, the closest system to Melmint is actually Senior Raj shares, but Senior Raj shares still tries to peg it to an external system, and its collateral is completely backed by the prospect of future growth, which is essentially a Ponzi scheme. So that's why Melmint, I think, is quite different from existing systems. So in conclusion, volatility is a really big problem, but fiat peg stable coins are probably not the way out because they sacrifice crucial properties of cryptocurrencies. Melman is the first value pegged cryptocurrency with no trusted parties, and simulation shows that it does have fairly robust performance. No, thank you. Okay, thanks so much, that was great. All right, um, we have microphones here if anyone wants to take the mic. Looks like we have someone here. Hi, uh, Hi. great talk. There's a lot to unpack there. Uh, I was just, could, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the, uh, that like proof of computation that you use in order to mint the Mets. Yes. It sounds kind of like an Oracle problem and it sounds no. like there's some trust involved, but I, maybe I didn't fully understand. Yeah, so basically what we do here is that um, there is a cryptographic primitive called a 
proof of sequential work, right? So essentially, you proof that you've iterated the hash function on itself a bunch of times, like the hash of a hash of a hash of a hash of a hash, right? Like do that like n times, and you can only do that sequentially because of the property of the hash function. Now, what you do is that essentially you, every time you prove to the blockchain that you've done this the blockchain gives you a certain amount of coins. And the amount of coins they give you is actually based on measuring how fast people are solving these things. So basically the idea here is that based on the speed of the fastest miner I've seen, how many days did you take to do this, okay? So, so that's why this is trustless. There are no oracles involved because we can actually measure and issue these coins in the same loop. And assuming that computers only get faster and not slower, the fastest value is gonna be your value, right? It's gonna be your cost for minting this coin. So this sort of avoids all the Oracle problems because time is one of the only things we can trustlessly measure, sort of measure on the blockchain, right? I see, thanks. So um, uh, proof of sequential computation can be used uh, for consensus by itself, right? So if I yeah. can create a time order, um, that's all I need and I can create consensus with that, right? Yeah. Um, now, running a CPU core uh, has a marginal cost. Yes. Um, now, I, I think there are a lot of people in this space that are making the mistake that a validator node or a CPU core is the value proposition, right? It's yeah. not true in the Bitcoin network where, yeah. uh, you know, miners deploy a lot of capital. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so, so in this kind of coin, um, you know, let's say I wanted to deploy $100 million worth of capital. Yeah. I'm not going to deploy by the $100 way, million like, worth of the CPU cores. By the way, like, this... In, in, in familiar with the blockchain, and also in other implementations, we're not gonna be using this proof of sequential work for consensus. It's completely separate from consensus. It's only for mon monetary policy. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, so so I, I would also, point, but it's not really a crucial part. So the idea here is that it's a price ceiling. So it's sort of a release valve mechanism. So if the price goes too big, then it becomes profitable to mine. So okay. it's almost never gonna be the case that it's profitable to have a million dollars in capital to invest in. Th and that's, days. that's my main yeah. point, is that um, if, if, the if the cost of this coin is the marginal cost of running a database, I mean, yeah. everybody in the financial sector is, is running a database, and the cost of running that database is generally, you know, very small part yeah. of their computation is to their their, their business, right? Yeah. They, they have to make enough money doing other things to yeah. make, justify running the database. Yeah. So if you bring the cost of uh, the asset down to the cost of running the database, yeah. this is a marginal cost. It's, yeah. it's, it's zero. It's not, comp not zero, right? Like, it's close it, it's to epsilon. zero. It's it's right. epsilon, but it's not zero. Like so, the, the idea but, here, but you're taking the smallest value, smallest it's, it's not, value it's not, in the it's, system. It's not running a database. Like the value of this coin is pegged to occupying a CPU core for 24 hours. Right. What, what I'm saying is that there's no way for me to take a billion dollars worth of capital and do that with it. Right? Yeah, no I'm not expecting anyone to. to I, I'm not expecting anyone to do that, and that's why in Melmint, the actual consensus is based on proof of stake with a completely different coin. Because like I'm not expecting people to throw lots of capital into it. This is just going to be used as money. Right? It's just going to be cash. Right? Okay. So um, consensus is necessary, not sufficient for something to be a financial asset. And what I'm saying yeah. is that you're saying that the cost of computation is the sufficiency, is the rest of the sufficiency. And I'm saying that's not enough. Uh, there has to be some other way for money to get into the system in the first place. Yeah. Well, in well in Bitcoin, how is it different? Well, you can deploy a lot more capital and mining equipment. Yeah, but I don't think that's what actually gives Bitcoin its value, right? Well, it gives it a price. It gives it a price floor, right? So it is a tie to the economic. No, I think it's the other way around. The people right. invest so much money into it because people want Bitcoins. And it's sort of this zero-sum game where people, like, throw in enough capital. And it's, it, the reason why Bitcoin mining is so capital intensive is because of the way mining works in Bitcoin, right? Because mining is like the zero-sum game where a fixed amount of Bitcoins is issued every minute and then people sort of race to it and therefore obviously the people with the most capital win. So obviously you're gonna be seeing a, a really capital intensive thing here. But like I don't think that is actually what gives Bitcoin its well, value. Neither here nor there. Will your system have the same property? Will people deploy millions of CPU cores for this? Um, definitely not because this task is not par parallelizable and it's yeah. optimized for commodity CPUs, right? So. Um, right, we'll so, 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 so this will be basically be packed to stuff like AWS prices. I don't, and once you actually mine coins at a large scale, it pushes the price down to the point you can't mine anymore because there's no fixed supply of coins. So, you know, if you actually spend a million dollars to mine my coin, it's almost certainly going to lose money, right? 
So, yeah. Uh, I want to give time for the last couple of questions. Yeah, um, thank you so much for your talk. It was really interesting to see also the simulations. Um, I, my question is, is it really at any point in time um, rational to hold a stable coin in this sense? Because assume you have today the stable coin and you want to buy something tomorrow. Um, assume then that, or in the case that the stable coin this, this pack holds. Yeah. And um, It's also never rational to hold cash, right? Sorry? It's also never rational to hold cash. Like in, it's for a save. If you want so to hold, if you want to secure money, like to, with respect to this pack, to this uh, fiat money, then it's more rational to hold cash. I would say, because if this pack, if this pack breaks, then you would lose money. And if you just sell your stablecoin in the moment and convert to cash and rebuy your stablecoin, yeah, when like you want to buy something, the stablecoin is more fine. rational. To like there are also security. transaction costs, right? Like f one one thing about this is that it is you're right in the sense that with a coin like you know the Mel, it is not rational for you to put your life savings in it and expect it to appreciate because it's almost certainly not going to. But as a sort of cash replacement, the idea here is that, for example, transaction fees on chain would be priced only in this mail. Like all your on chain, the whole on chain economy would sort of be running on this sort of cash as its monetary base. But obviously, people are still going to be saving their money in more, you know, appreciating assets. Like I, I don't think that you know. I think it's actually bad for something that you want to be used as money to be used as a investment vehicle, largely because that actually. Um, reduces this, its velocity and also makes this price more volatile. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, can I ask another question? Uh, we actually have two okay. more, yeah. so okay, then, uh, ask maybe take it offline. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Um, so let's say I, I believe the, the the stable currency thing, and, and then I buy it, yeah. buy a lot of it, yeah. believing that it's stable. Yeah. You know, maybe I watched your slides and yeah. I don't really understand it, yeah. but it's stable, so you yeah. know, I bought a lot of it. And let's say the peg fails. Yeah. Uh, who is the best target for me to sue? <laughs> well, like, I would suppose whatever caused that thing to fail, perhaps. So, so, so the thing about this is really that under normal economic conditions, it should not fail. It'll only really be a problem if, let's say, the whole system's demand drops and there's a future market expectation that it's only going down. Now, in that case, well, there's very little you can do, honestly. Like, even in fiat currencies, they all fail under such these circumstances. As a CEO, then, is that, is that a possibility? Well, it, and it definitely is a possibility. It's just that, like, like, again, like, the thing about a lot of these risks, a lot of risks are uninsurable. Like, if, if you have, for example, if you have a currency, the risk that everyone just dump it and never use it again, you can't mind control them, right? They're going to dump your currency. Now, the more you try harder to peg it, even under this circumstance, the more the harder it feels when it does fail, right? Like you, you can only push your fat tails, you, your tails into further in the end and make it like even worse. And even though they're, the more you decrease the probability, the worse it will be when it actually happens. So it's really this sort of trade-off. But then I think that like generally, stable coins obsess too much over never failing. And when they fail, it's spectacular. Like if you look at new bits. When their peg failed, it basically dropped to like 5% of its price, right? Because everyone just fled. Because the, their entire value proposition was that it wouldn't fail. Now, the other thing about my currency is that it's pegged to this sort of opa opaque value unit called the DOSC that itself also fluctuates over time. So no one's going to come in here, OK, this is going to be $1 all the time. And if it gets 90 cents, I'm going to dump all of it, right? The value proposition of my coin is not that it's stable, but rather that it's stable-ish and it's the main currency of a big blockchain, right? If hopefully my blockchain is big. This is just, so I think that's really the difference here. Like if your entire value proposition of the coin is that it's stable, then yes, that'll be a very big possibility that once it, the peg drops, everyone will flee and people will start want to sue people. But if this is just another cryptocurrency, just you know, less volatile and less prone to bubbles, then I think it'll be a very different story. Okay, last question from online. Uh, Tarun Chitra asks, do we need to use non-interactive non proofs of proofs of work, or does Jobino's new proof of necessary work suffice? The latter seems easier to use for this context. Um, so I would say that anything that can prove that you did a certain amount of sequential work 
is required. It is it, is okay as long as it's non-interactive in the sense that um, you you can embed a proof that you did that in the blockchain and all the validators can check it, right? Like, uh, so uh, one other thing that might that could work is VDF. So variable delay functions could also work, but they do a little too much and they're not quantum resistant. So like. Uh, not any five proofs of sequential work are really cool because the only cryptographic primitive they need is a hash function and any hash function. So that's that makes them robust to many classes of attacks and you know ASICs and stuff like that. So fantastic. Thank you so much.